Welcome to Arts Express. This is Prairie Miller, and on the show, in news from strange places... Hello everyone, I'm Matt Lyer, and this is an FNN News Break. In political news, the Biden administration recently authorized the bombing of strategic targets in Syria in response to attacks on American forces. However, some Democrats were furious about the decision, calling it reckless, violent, and toxic. A White House insider had this to say, quote, I have no idea how the president could have made such an irresponsible, cold-hearted decision. I don't think he's taken into consideration the impact large-scale detonation of explosives can have on global warming and the environment. End quote. With the inflation rate skyrocketing, some rumors indicate the U.S. Treasury is poised to print more money. However, some economists warn that this will do more harm than good, causing the inflation rate to reach epic proportions. To avoid a public relations disaster, the U.S. government has hired the head of marketing at Doritos to put a positive spin on the situation, resulting in the government's new slogan, Spend all you want, we'll print more. Jay Leno is in talks to lead the campaign. A wax museum in San Antonio, Texas, was forced to remove a figure of former President Donald Trump because spectators kept punching it in the face. Oddly enough, this wasn't the only incident in which waxworks of former presidents have been vandalized. Other statues that needed recent repair included George Washington for repeated removal of his teeth, Abraham Lincoln for tugging on his beard, and Bill Clinton for repeated attempts at being lewinsky Many older adults will remember being taught that sticks and stones would break their bones, but words would never hurt them. In 2021, that idiom has been replaced with words are violence. Watchdog group STFU recently petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court to set new laws to govern violent speech. Under the new laws, violent speakers, or worderers, could be held accountable for first, second, and third degree worder, as well as word slaughter. If convicted, guilty parties could face fines, community service, and up to five years of going to bed without supper. In other news, McDonald's has recently come under fire after releasing the new jerk chicken sandwich. Critics call out the sandwich's lack of authenticity, which simply uses a jerk seasoned sauce rather than a traditional Jamaican jerk chicken recipe. The recent backlash has put the rest of the famous fast food chain's menu under scrutiny for containing items that do not live up to their names. The Quarter Pounder, for example, weighs only 3.5 ounces, the McNuggets contain no gold, and the Happy Meal is only mildly content. I'm Matt Lyer, and this has been an FNN News Break. And thank you, FNN News and Matt Lyer, for that report. And you can check out more FNN News Breaks at their Channel F Studios on YouTube. And coming up next on Arts Express... From his Atlanta headquarters... Send this to the president. He flashes the news to Washington by telegraph. Atlanta is ours. And fairly won. This city has done more to carry on and sustain this war than any other, say perhaps Richmond. And now, since they have done so much to destroy us and our government, we have to destroy them. War is cruelty. There is no use trying to reform it. The cooler it is, the sooner it will be over. And that was actor Bill Abers Jr., best known as a master of horror, portraying Civil War General William Sherman in Sherman's March in his very first film back in 2007. And Oberst is our guest this week. More of that coming up. But says Oberst of his multitude of Gothic depictions on screen, and apparently many more in the works to come. Quote, the metaphor of the wounded monster has been the metaphor of my life. I was raised in South Carolina among the ruins of old moss-draped plantations. 
haunted, ghostly places. And what about what seems like an increasing trend? Horror movies lately as a showcase for horrors in the real world. Case in point, Arts Express recently spoke to actor Michael Pere, starring in Painkiller, as a greedy, malevolent doctor peddling prescription painkillers to physically and emotionally vulnerable patients and addicting them for profit. That other pandemic afflicting this country. And this week calling into the show is horror icon Bill Oberst Jr., who stars as well in Painkiller as a combo podcaster prophet of doom and the masked medical avenger in question regarding the very double meaning of the movie's title. And regarding Painkiller, up for discussion, something much more than meets the eye, namely screenwriter and co-star Tom Parnell, whose own young son in real life passed away as a victim of prescription drug addiction. Oberst will also be delving into the real-life figures whose incarnations he's assumed on screen, ranging from Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln versus zombies, Eichmann in Confessions of a Self-Hating Jew, JFK, Jesus, Woody Allen, and Hitler in his upcoming movie, The Message, and what creeps him out about celebrity culture. First, some scenes from Painkiller, then Bill Oberst Jr., who was the very first recipient of the Lon Chaney Horror Achievement Award, presented to him by Lon Chaney's great-grandson, Ron Chaney. There are more than 70,000 overdose deaths each year in this country. Most people still envision big boats smuggling in the dope. Low-level dealers selling it on the street. Yeah, that still goes on. But the real culprits, it's the pharmaceutical companies, the doctors they grease. You come into my office to tell me what to do and how to live? Just give advice. You take your advice. Get the hell out of here. It's not the answer I was looking for. More Americans who died of opioid abuse and were killed in the Vietnam War. And as long as it makes money, nobody gives a damn. That's not a conspiracy. You tell me what it is. Fear-mongering. Fake news being pushed by a liar like you. You got a lot of nerve showing up here. I'm surprised you even knew about this side of town. You kidding me? I grew up on this side of town. So what are we going to do about the legalized pushers? Hmm? Appeal to their better nature? They got no better nature. Are you the CEO of Ad6 Chemicals? Yeah. Who the hell are you? Your conscience. You know, I keep hearing they're going after doctors next. They are. They'll throw a few to the wolves. Optics matter. I'm a pretty serious guy. I think I'm getting under your partner's skin. Hey, Perry, this is Bill Obers Jr. How are you? Okay, and welcome. Well, thank you. I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, I like your show, and I like your work. I admire what you do. Oh, wow. Where are you calling from? I'm on the East Coast at the moment. I'm way down in a place called Pauly's Island, South Carolina, at my beach house. Oh, okay. All right. What was it about Painkiller, the story, and your character that drew you in? Um, two things drew me in. One, that uh, Mark Savage directed it. Uh, Mark was a cult director in Australia for years before he came to Los Angeles. And I'm very drawn to cult and art house cinema. And I, I respect the hell out of Mark. And the second thing was that Tom Parnell, who co-wrote the story and the co-stars in it, he was writing from a place of real loss. His son, uh, Jordan, passed away at the age of 21 from an opioid accidental overdose after being prescribed opioids after a sports injury. So that was the basis for the movie, which spun out as a sort of revenge fantasy. Um, and that's what drew me in. And what was it like for you in this very unusual situation, even for an actor, interacting with the character played by Tom Parnell, 
whose son actually was a victim of prescription drugs in the real world. It was very strange. That's a very perceptive question that you ask. Um, uh, Tom is a friend. I've worked with him on another film with Ian Mark. But doing these scenes with him, talking about this, looking into his eyes, knowing what he himself had experienced, uh, was very strange and a little heavy, and you feel a responsibility to get it right. You know, I, I'm kind of the indie horror guy, and so uh, a lot of what I do is um, peripheral and throwaway, but there's some things that you feel a real responsibility for getting right, and this was one. Yeah. What do you feel it is about you that led you to embrace horror movies as a life passion and becoming a horror icon? Um, well, the camera likes to see me do malevolent things. The camera, re- <laughs> the camera reads my face as malevolent. And so you have to play your face or you don't work. And then, but, but also beyond that, the, the metaphor of the wounded monster has been the ruling metaphor of my life. Um, and I think think that if we realized more that we were all monstrous inside, we would not see one another as other so much as variations of ourselves and potentiality. Um, We're all wounded monsters, and we're just afraid to show our wounds. And so that's what draws me to horror, is the opportunity to, to be monstrous, but also to invite the audience to see themselves in the monster and vice versa. And what do you think it is about horror movies that has such an enduring fascination for audiences? The white elephant in the room of life is death. We don't discuss it enough, particularly anymore in our modern culture, especially in Western culture. Um, and we have to deal with the fact that we live for a while. We don't ultimately matter. And we're gone, and no one will remember us given enough time. It's a hell of a thing to deal with. (laughs) We don't deal with it. And horror allows us to face death, to embrace it, to play with it, most importantly. Um, Mark Savage, who directed this movie, has a saying. He says, when you embrace the darkness, you know it, and thus it is less dark. And I see that your very first film, Sherman's March, a documentary in which you portray General Sherman, is not horror, or actually, maybe it is horror, historically speaking. What was that first choice for you all about, and that led you into it? I had never done film or television before. I just fell into that accidentally. Um, I was raised in the American South, and so Sherman has always been presented as a demon in the mythology of the South. The, the uh, you know... Uh, came down in war and uh, all these war atrocities and horrible stories. And so to step into the shoes of the demon <laughs> was really appealing to me. Um, something that Sherman said, which is, um, um, I think he had expelled the residents of Atlanta close to Christmas time to turn it into a wartime city once he conquered it. And the mayor said, you can't do this. It's, you know, it's cold, it's Christmas. And, and Sherman said, you might as well appeal to a thunderstorm as to the horrors of war. War is cruelty, sir, and the crueler it is, the sooner it will be over. And and that makes sense to me. It's hard. It's a hard truth, but it makes sense. And so uh, I, I enjoy playing Sherman for that reason. And where were you raised in the South? I was raised in South Carolina, out in the country, among the ruins of old moss draped plantations, which had been abandoned for years when I was a kid. They're all golf courses now. It was a very romantic, uh, haunted, ghostly place to grow up. You've also played some other real-life people, Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln versus Zombies, Jesus, and Adolf Eichmann, and Confessions of a Self-Hating Jew. What can you say about these characters and the challenges of portraying real-life figures? And when auditioning for the role of Eichmann for The Glass House... You were followed and harassed in the street. What was that all about? 150,000 in Budapest. Many of these are in hiding. It is difficult to enumerate them exactly. That is also the issue with the Swiss. What about the Swiss? Apparently, Regent Hothi has agreed to allow the Swiss Council to issue protective passes to Jews claiming they are Swiss citizens. How many passes? 7,800. It's fine. 
tell the Swiss Council we will not interfere with them as long as they do not interfere with us. They can have their 7800. I want all the rest in Auschwitz. I am a, um, a great believer that there is no other. There are only versions of ourselves which we have not realized. Um, there is no human action or human actor, no matter how heinous, which could not be us. And so for that reason, stepping into the shoes of, of um, someone like Eichmann, it's not difficult. You just have to allow yourself to say, this could easily be me. I am not above this, and I'm not different. Uh, and that's what allows you to put on these various uniforms and faces and beards, and we're, we're all just versions of one another. That's the way I approach history. And when you were approached in the street in Nazi character, how did you ward them off? I, uh, I was uh, spit on, and I didn't ward them off um, because I thought, this is good. <laughs> this, is, this is good because this is cathartic, because I'm representing something which is abhorrent, and often that's my job, to represent something that's abhorrent, so people can say, my God, is that really inhumanity? And the answer is yes, and I represent it. So, yeah, I didn't ward it off. And I see that you're coming up in nearly 40 movies. How did that happen? And is there anything you'd like to say about any of them? Um, well, Perry, I, am, I have a unique face. And so when they want someone to represent a character that immediately on the screen, you say, that guy's up to something. There's a small group of us, and I'm one of them. Uh, so there are a little group of us that work a lot because of that. Uh, I, I, I enjoy my horror movies very much. Um, I just signed actually to play Adolf Hitler in a World War II drama called The Message, which will be filmed in Romania. And uh, that's one that I'm really, uh, I know looking forward to doesn't sound right, but I am because of the challenge of, again, and, and because of this core belief I have that even at the level of Hitler, these are potentialities and potential versions of ourselves. When I, when I announce, oh, I'm, you know, I'm attached to play Hitler for this drama, many, many, many people on social media said, oh, you know, use the term monster. How could you play such a monster? And what a monster is. But he wasn't a monster. He was, he was human. Who, who acted in monstrous ways. That's an important distinction for me. And what about your remark, quote, the real horror in the world, the cruelty, the coldness of heart, the emptiness, the emptiness of celebrity culture? Thank you for mentioning that. Yes, uh, celebrity culture is truly a horror. It's something I've had to consciously turn away from. I mean, I'm not an A-list or anything, but I have my little bit of experience with it in my niche. Um, and it it can be soul-killing if you embrace it in any way. If you embrace the idea that there's a stanchion and a velvet rope, and behind that velvet rope is where you belong, and other people belong on the other side of the velvet rope, <laughs> and they stand and look at you as you stand on this piece of industrial red carpet, which is supposed to represent your hierarchy and your status, it's poisonous absolutely poisonous because no matter what list you're on, there's always another list that you want to be on. And then you begin to think, even if you don't say, you think the words, don't you know who I am? And that's the beginning of death. And what about when you said, my sympathies have always been with the monster? Please elaborate. Always and ever, Prairie. Always and ever with the monster. When I was a kid, I felt like a monster because I was different in every way. A boy in the South could be different. And I felt like a monster, and I liked them. They were my friends, and I loved them, and I cheered for them. And I still do. <laughs> and would you say you're anything in real life like the scary characters you play? I'd like to say no, but <laughs> the answer... The answer can't be no, the camera wouldn't see it, because the camera is a truth detector, and you can't lie to it. When it's up close looking in your eyes, you can't lie. If the camera sees malevolence in you, then it exists in you. I, I hope, by the grace of God, that I suppress it, deflect it, reorient it, but yeah, it must be there that the camera wouldn't see it. And which brings up something you also said about cameras. 
the camera sees into our dungeons and digs around in our dirt. Mm -hmm, absolutely, because it looks in the eyes. And camera acting is about nothing but eyes. If you get the eyes right, everything else follows. And the only way you get the eyes right is to tell the truth. You can't lie or pretend. So you can't, you, you, you can't pretend to be a thing. You just have to be the thing. And if the camera sees that in your eyes, then <laughs> there's nothing more powerful than a shot looking into the eyes of someone who's telling the truth. Because you see the, the, you see the eyes begin to change. As you realize that the camera's looking at you and you're naked, everything falls away, and the camera does see a lot deeper into you than you'd like it to. And what else can you say about your Hitler movie coming up? It's, the working title is The Message, and it's about the complicity of the Romanian government with the Nazis and uh, the decisions on how complicit they how complicit they should be, what the choice was to, uh, you know, to, to, to resist or to comply once the Nazis said this is the way it will be. And apparently there was a lot of complicity across Europe that has not made the history books quite yet. And a couple of films have come out recently in that regard, Six Minutes to Midnight with Eddie Izzard and two Danish films, Into the Darkness and Murderous Trance with Josh Lucas and Six Minutes to Midnight, which is historically based that Hitler actually thought that Britain would join him in conquering the world because the two countries had such close relationships prior to World War II. It's true, um, and as a person of faith, that's something that I grapple with as well. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of complicity. Yeah. And any last word about Painkiller and why people should see the movie? Well, I, I describe Painkiller as sort of a Charles Bronson death wish, uh, brought up to date for the epidemic. Um, yeah. it, it, it's, a, it's a revenge fantasy, and my character's solution, of course, killing people peripherally involved with the industry is not the way to go. <laughs> but there's some catharsis to it. Um, and the filmmakers did want to get across a message, which many people understand, but some don't. Um, and that is that big pharma, in many cases, knew exactly what they were doing. And uh, so I hope that people enjoy the catharsis, but also come away with the reinforcement of that message. The, the, the big question is, of course, you know, we're trying to get a handle on opioids, but something else will come. There'll be the next and the next and the next. Capitalism, by design, doesn't look out for your best interest. So what kind of safeguards and guardrails should we have? Okay, thanks so much. Curry, thank you for what you do for independent art and artists. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. And Painkiller is out now in release. And next up on Arts Express, Who Am I? Everybody has a body. Author and art and social critic Olivia Lang phones in from Suffolk in the UK to talk about her latest work, Everybody, a book about freedom. Jack Shalom investigates what that's all about, exploring bodies in peril and bodies as a force for change, with connections to Wilhelm Reich, Freud, Karl Marx, and Van Gogh, character armor, sex, fascism, and Jack tripping on mescaline. <laughs> Hi, this is Jack Shalom. Everybody has a body, and everybody is the name of a new intriguing book by art and social critic Olivia Lang. It's a book about bodies in peril and bodies as a force for change, and what exactly are the bodily limits of pleasure and freedom. I'm very happy to be speaking with Olivia Lang, now in Suffolk, England. Hi, Olivia. Hey, hi. Hey, Olivia, I really enjoyed your book. And at the beginning of your book, you write, my childhood taught me about the body as an object whose freedom is limited by the world. I wanted to understand the forces that still shape and limit bodily freedom now. Can you say more about that? 
I certainly can. I grew up in a gay family in the 1980s in England at a time that was intensely homophobic. And at a time that there was an explicit law, Section 28, which testified to the um, unreality of the gay family as a pretended family unit. So explicitly, the kind of family I grew up in was the wrong sort of family. And that just set me off thinking it, a sort of train of thought that I've I've stayed with over the decades, which is about why are some bodies regarded as wrong, regarded as dangerous or regarded as pariahs because of bodily factors that are nothing to do with the individuals we are because of skin color, because of gender and because of sexuality. The book has as its center an amazing person, Wilhelm Wright, one of Sigmund Freud's most brilliant protégés. And a burning question that they both tackle about bodies is whether emotions could have bodily consequences. And if so, how could that be treated? How how is Reich's approach different from Freud? Well, Freud thought that people had symbolic symptoms, that hysteria meant that something that had unsettled somebody psychically might transmit as a sort of a lost voice or an inability to swallow. These are two of his famous cases. And that that could be traced back by the psychotherapist, a skilled reader who could find out the originating trauma, solve it, and then they'd be healed. What Reich saw was very different. He sat in his consulting room in Vienna in the 1920s, and he saw his patients come in, struggle to speak, and at the same time, exhibit a kind of bodily rigidity, a sort of tension that was everywhere in them. It was in how they spoke, their voices might be muted or extra loud, how they held their faces, how they laughed, what their shoulders were doing. And he felt that what was happening was that people had defended against feeling, especially traumatic feeling or forbidden feeling, sexual feeling, shameful feeling from childhood, and that that was still legible in their bodies, that the things that had happened to them still lived on in their bodies. And that, to me, was such an exciting idea. And that's what he called character armor? That's what he called character armor. And I think one of the simplest ways to understand this is to think about a soldier. A soldier is disciplined away from feeling and they stand up upright and you see that rigidity in them. And to a lesser extent, I think that's happening with all of us. And it starts when children are very small. Boys don't cry is a classic example of something that creates character armoring. Girls don't sit like that. These sort of ideas that some aspect of how we naturally respond to the world are not allowed and that they need to be defended against. And the other thing, of course, is traumatic experience. We tense up around bodily traumas or emotional traumas, and we carry that right through our lives. And Reich is living at a very particular time. He's living in Vienna in the middle of two world wars, and he tries to fuse the work of Freud and Marx, much to the discomfort of the followers of each, (laughs) <laughs> and he he realizes that the young people joining the Nazis were not so dissimilar from his comrades in the Communist Party in terms of their living under the same material conditions. But some of them are choosing fascism, and he wishes to understand that. How did Reich respond to that? The thing with Reich, and where Reich really breaks away from Freud, is that he thinks it isn't enough to just look at the constellation of the family and the personal trauma. He wants to look at the political world as well. He was seeing patients who were very underprivileged, and it was very clear to him that social conditions were playing a part in that. So this is where he starts to bring Marxist ideas in. He's also fascinated by the idea of sex as a liberating force. He can see that young people are struggling with their sexual identities, Mm -hmm. and he wants sexual lives to be more liberated. So when Wright got to Weimar Berlin, he was a ardent sexual liberationist. He was part of that much larger movement. Mm -hmm. And he felt that the Nazis were coming to power because they were preying on people who were inhibited and who were damaged, traumatized, if you like, and very easy prey for Nazi ideology. And as an anti-fascist, he wanted to prevent that. And some of his ideas, I have to say, are sort of slightly part company with. I'm not sure that sexual expression is going to stop fascism, sadly. Uh-huh. But I think that he was onto something with this idea that the social, the political and the individual are all live in us and they all have to be dealt with if we want to change our political realities. And how did he see the issue of character armor interfacing with the ideas of fascism? I think 
I mean, you can see it yourself looking in pictures. He really saw that there is this moment in Germany where a crisis is happening, unemployment, people are very desperate, and suddenly in marches the block, these very disciplined bodies. And to frightened people, it's attractive. That fascist block looks appealing to them, and they fall under the spell of it. And Reich thought that was very, very dangerous. And he thought if people were empowered and if people could be help to deal with their own personal trauma, then they wouldn't be so susceptible to the lure of fascism. And in a way, the Nazis' subsequent actions regarding sexual freedoms bore Reich's ideas out, didn't they? Absolutely. I mean, it's almost the first thing that the Nazis do is they start to limit all of the advances of the sexual liberationists, and they start to recriminalize abortion, recriminalize homosexuality, intense punishments that only get worse and worse during the years of the Second World War, as, as we all know. So Reich is sort of saying uh, that the sexual energy has to be released. It's being blocked in the body. But Freud thought just the opposite, that sexual energy uh, had to be controlled, that it was an anarchic energy um, and that it was dangerous for society to act on every libidinous urge. Absolutely. But the, I think the thing with Reich is, you know, he he has been mocked continually over the decades for being the orgasm man, believing in this sexual revolution. And I think that's become increasingly trivialized over the years as well. Mm -hmm. And coming back to Reich fresh now and looking at his work, it began to become apparent to me that really he was somebody who grew up in a very violent family. His father was violent to his mother who had had an affair and mm. he brutalized her until she ended up committing suicide. And I think that trauma lies at the heart of Reich's understanding of sexuality, that what he is really looking for and the sexual revolution he believes in is a world in which women can be sexually free without the fear of violence or death. And that world has not been achieved yet a hundred years after Reich's first began to talk about it, which seems extraordinary to me. So there's always this tension about where one person's freedom impinges on another person's freedom. And in a way, Reich was, was about liberating sexual freedom and energy. And not to make it too simplistic, but Freud felt that in civilization and its discontents, that the whole purpose of civilization was to uh, control and channel sexual energies into societal institutions. But the, the differences between Freud and Reich were not just uh, psychoanalytic. They, were, they also had to do with politics. Uh, what happened between Freud and Reich as the Nazis came to power? Well, this is a really tragic story that has been uncovered by historians sort of piece by piece. So Freud believed that neutrality was the way to handle the rise of the Nazis, that for psychoanalysis to survive, it was absolutely vital that it didn't take sides. And Reich, the anti-fascist activist, said, you can't not take sides under fascism. You have to take a side against fascism. By this time, he was based in Berlin in the polyclinic. And the polyclinic, this is the sort of hub of psychoanalysis in Germany, um, was aronized, was taken over by Nazi supporters, and all of the Jewish analysts went into exile with one or two exceptions, including Reich. So Reich ended up fleeing across the mountains into Austria and from then on was a person in exile. He knew that it wasn't possible to practice with neutrality. That isn't something you can do when there is a fascist government, when there is a fascist rule. And Freud is a magnificent figure in so many ways, but I think this really is Freud's least fine hour that mm. he really... Um, was furious with Reich for, for taking these stands, for being so vocal against the Nazis. And at this point, he decided to expel him from the psychoanalytic association, which broke Reich, which really destroyed Reich as, as an emotional person. And, and, and Freud's daughter also, Anna. Anna, absolutely. Yeah, Anna was very adamant that both Reich and the other Jewish members of the Berlin Polyclinic who were, um, who were involved in anti-fascism, she was profoundly antagonistic to them and one of them ended up going to prison and for her for her anti-fascist activities and Anna oh Freud was God. furious with her so it's quite a shocking story really wow 
Freud and Anna Freud are also Jewish. So it's not that there's anti-Semitism involved in this. This is just different people's ideas of what the threat of the Nazis means and how to best handle it. Right. He wanted to save the institution of psychoanalytic theory, as he saw it, at all costs. At all costs. Yeah. Let's follow Reich a little bit further, because he's such an interesting character. And of course, then later on, you do uh, free associate in some ways his influences later on. But Reich makes it eventually to the United States. And and you're right that the reason Reich isn't more respected or discussed is that the excesses of the second half of his life start overwhelming the first. And in particular, he starts talking about this mysterious energy called the orgone. What was that? I think really, I've spent a lot of time trying to understand what Reich meant by orgone. I think really what he meant was something like what Freud meant by libido. He meant life energy. He meant the thing that animates us, the thing that energizes us. But he believed that that was a physical force that could be measured biologically. And I think this is where Wright really starts to go astray. That It was, it was an external force, right? It, it was outside. It permeated the universe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this, this is where we start to stray onto quite woo, woo-woo territory. And I think it becomes trickier to talk about. Freud sensibly allowed things to be sort of in the realm of metaphor. And I think they make more sense to think about like that. Once Reich determined to be proved right, determined to show Freud he was wrong, starts to carry out experiments, starts to try to measure things, starts to try to prove things as if he is a biologist or as if he is a chemist, it really begins to go wrong for him. I know this may sound strange, but Reich's depiction of the Oregon is nothing less than a mescaline trip I once had. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I, I once I once had an artist tell me, and I, I was kind of shocked by it, but it was interesting. I once had an artist tell me that Van Gogh's Starry Night was about the Oregon energy. I, I that think that was that a too. It's funny, it. as you started to say that, I was thinking about that painting. That that um, and Reich believed that Reich thought that Van Gogh had seen what he had seen. That this revelation that he uh-huh. was suddenly seeing, he was up in Maine on a camping trip, and he suddenly felt that the universe was alive. No mescaline, as far as I know, was involved. But this is a revelation that all kinds of mystics, thinkers, artists have had over the centuries. He's not alone in that. What he's alone in is really giving it this name and believing that it's responsive to the kind of fairly crude experiments that he's carrying out. And so he's building these boxes of steel, wool, and wood that people can sit in to capture this orgone energy. And and the FDA gets on to him, and they're quite vicious with him, aren't they? The culmination of their pursuit, which cost an unbelievable amount of money, a quarter of their budget, the culmination of that pursuit is that all of his books, not just the books about Orgone, but the mass psychology of fascism and the books that he was writing in Europe before the war, were burnt. He's the only person whose books were burnt on American soil. He remains the only person who was involved Amazing. in a state-sanctioned book burning. And, and this is this is in the 50s. This isn't uh, it, it, before World War II or anything. This is quite late. This is in fairly recent past. And whether you think that his ideas were pseudoscientific or not, the kind of punishment he underwent is extraordinarily large for the crime that he was supposed to have committed. I mean, Olivia, Reich lost his bearings in a way. I mean, he kind of went a little crazy. What what accounts for that? Do you, I, I know this is far out, but do you think he was the target of some MK Ultra type attack? Or was it inevitable? Was his own past so disturbed that it was bound to come back and disturb him? Or, or was he releasing what should have been repressed too quickly? What, what was going on with him? And we'll have to stop right here for now with part one of our interview with Olivia Lang, author of the new book published by W.W. W. Norton, titled Every Body, a book about freedom. Next week in the concluding part of the interview, Olivia Lang will talk about some of the artists and thinkers who were influenced by Reich's work, including Andrea Dworkin, James Baldwin, Nina Simone, and Lorraine Hansberry. This is Jack Shalom for Arts Express with host Prairie Miller. My heart is sad and lonely For you I 
Music you've been listening to is Let's All Chant by the Michael Zager Band and Body and Soul performed by Nellie Mackay. And now on Arts Express. Speaking of news from strange places, where am I? It started out like any other workday. Or did it? In our radio drama corner, an excerpt from Gray Michael, the Bermudez Triangle, performed by Louis Bermudez a presentation of chilling tales for dark nights. If you've ever had that feeling of disappearing down a Bermuda Triangle in one way or another. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights It started out like any other workday. I had houses to sell and people who wanted to buy them. Honestly, I've always found being a realtor embarrassingly easy. People seek you out and ask you to sell them incredibly high-ticket items. I've done other sales jobs, and you always have to talk the buyers into extras, into upgrades, all for a tiny commission. With houses, it's so much easier. Your customers walk in already prepared to sign their life away for the next 30 years, so it's easy to convince them to go for the nicer house, the better neighborhood, the higher price tag, the bigger commission, from my point of view. Obviously, it's not always completely smooth. I've had some real nightmare clients. Who hasn't? I've been yelled at, talked down to, insulted, even physically threatened on a couple of occasions, but 90% of my job was just about keeping a smile on my face and saying empty phrases like, okay, I hear you, or let's keep looking. Easy as pie. So I didn't expect this day to be anything out of the ordinary. Houses had been selling well lately and I had just gotten several new ones added to my roster. If I kept my numbers up, I was on track to have the most sales of the quarter, so I was pretty motivated to get out there and get folks into a new house. I usually like to do a walkthrough beforehand to make sure that there aren't any surprises, but I hadn't had a chance to do that with my upcoming afternoon showing. If I had, maybe it would have turned out a lot better for the Hubers. Then again, maybe it would have turned out a lot worse for me, so I don't know. The house looked fine from the outside. It was a California split level, a little under 2,000 square feet, a classy mix of brick and wood siding. The house and land were well-maintained, and I could see that Mrs. Huber, Marilyn, was already charmed by it. It was within their price range and the school district they were looking for, and basically everything was just falling into place. I could smell an easy sale. I was going to be able to knock this one off on day one, and then it'd just be a matter of paperwork. I refrained from rubbing my hands together in glee as I walked the Hubers up to the front door, but only barely. That's how good I was feeling about this. 
Inside was great too, at least at first. Hardwood floors in the entry hall, big windows letting the whole place glow in the afternoon sun, nice neutral colors on the walls, and a pleasant smell in the air. It was picture-perfect staging, and the Hubers were eating it up. Irving was pointing out fancy features in the kitchen. Marilyn was talking about having people over for parties, and I just followed along pretending they needed me there. I didn't have to do a thing. The house was selling itself. Everything went perfectly right, up until we were leaving. We'd finished touring the top floor, and they'd both gushed about how perfect the view from the master bedroom was. I was leading the way down the stairs, chatting over my shoulder with the Hubers and keeping one hand on the railing to guide myself along. I wasn't really paying much attention. How much attention does anyone ever pay to stairs? These were carpeted, they didn't squeak, and the wooden posts and railings were solid and attractive. They successfully connected the floors of the house. That's all you can really say about stairs. Suddenly, Marilyn broke into my patter. Sorry. This is a strange question, but how many floors does this house have? Uh, Three, including the finished basement, I told her, wondering why she was asking. We just finished walking through them all. Right, that's what I thought. Only, this is the second flight of stairs, and we're still heading to the front hallway. I honestly had no idea what she meant at first. Obviously, it wasn't the second flight of stairs, or we would be on our way to the basement. These weren't the basement stairs. Therefore, we hadn't gone down two flights. I tried to think of a way to say, you have not successfully counted to one. That didn't sound patronizing or rude. Finding nothing, instead, I said, well, we're here now, at least. We can... I stopped dead on a small landing where the stairs made a right turn. It should have been just a couple more stairs to the entryway. Instead, I was looking at the hallway leading to the bedrooms, the one on the top floor of the house. I looked behind me. At the top of the stairs, I could see the hallway we just left. My mind lurch, trying to find some sense to seize onto. It was a three-level house. I was at the base of some stairs. I could see other stairs ahead of me, leading down. Therefore, I must be on the middle level where the entryway was. It's just that I wasn't. I was on the top level, having taken stairs down to get there. Something's wrong, I said stupidly. Irving and Marilyn reached out and held each other's hands. They looked around nervously. I realized that they were waiting for me to do something. I was in charge here after all. Let's just... Let's just take the stairs down, I suggested, suiting action to word. This time I kept my eyes focused ahead, watching every step. I could hear the Hubers walking behind me, their paired treads only a stair away. Ordinarily, I would have been annoyed to have a client stepping on my heels like that, but right now, I didn't blame them at all. Eleven stairs down brought us to a right turn landing. With trepidation, I made the turn, hoping that somehow I just misunderstood something before, that I'd somehow failed to use stairs correctly. My hopes were dashed as I stepped out into the same carpeted hallway leading to the bedrooms. The ground floor was still somehow below us. The Hubers exchanged wide-eyed glances. I don't understand this said Marilyn. Well, look, said Irving, trying to be reasonable. If down doesn't work, maybe up will. He turned and began to walk back up the stairs. Struck by a sudden curiosity, I moved across the hall to look at the stairs leading down. Marilyn kept her position on the landing so she could see both of us. When the stairs came into view, I saw exactly what I'd feared. Although Irving had gone up the stairs behind me, I was now ahead of him on the floor he was climbing to. His face blanched when he saw me. This... This is impossible. He looked back at Marilyn below me. How is this happening? I can see you. Marilyn called weakly to me. From both directions, I can see you at the top of the stairs, she pointed. And at the bottom over here. 
She turned her head and gestured. Suddenly, feeling weak, I sat down against the wall, taking solace in its solidity. I closed my eyes and pressed my fingers to my temples, willing this all to be some sort of fever dream. Are you all right? Irving called. I heard his footsteps start toward me. He was only four or five steps from the top. Somehow, though, they kept going. I opened my eyes. Irving was climbing the stairs, a look of terror on his face. He scrambled faster and faster, yet he never moved forward. Marilyn screamed. I leapt to my feet. Behind Irving, the staircase was lengthening, adding a stair beneath his feet for every step he took. I lunged forward, my hand extended for him to grab, but as I reached for him, a dozen new stairs appeared, dragging him away from me. Go back down, I shouted. Irving turned and tried to run, but it was too late. The stairs stretched away at a frightening rate, a corridor reaching out to infinity. Irving was reduced to a tiny speck somewhere in the middle, and although I could hear Marilyn screaming behind me, I could also hear a tiny version echoing faintly up the walls of what had been the staircase in front of me. Less than a second later, the staircase snapped back into place, the same eleven steps there should have always been. Irving was gone. And the chilling tales for Dark Knight's channel is our best of the net hotspot this week. And more from that strange tale in the future, or maybe not. You know, it is that Bermuda Triangle. And that's all we have time for today on Arts Express, Expression in the Arts. And if you'd like to express yourself too, you can write to us at theradiogoddess at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Prairie Miller leaving the station.